and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer here in the temple, a man who's been writing RPGs since 2007, and is and is responsible for thing for things like the Black Sword hack, along with a whole lot of others. Save your Blue Oyster Cult jokes. We'll get to that later. The one and only, don't make any Star Trek jokes at his expense, Kobayashi. Hey, Hello, how are you, man. Hello, man. Nice to be here. Nice to have nice to have you in the temple. Mm. So. A tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Uh, yes, that's quite interesting because, in fact, my first uh, my first introduction to, to role-playing games was a nightmare. In fact, my, one of my friends had... Uh, you know the red box, mm -hmm. Mobile red Redbox, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, you, we have this new game. You know, with my brother, it's fun. You should come. We will play." So I come. Uh, he gives me a character sheet. It doesn't explain anything to me. And ten minutes later, I, I'm playing a thief, and I'm dead. So the session was it. It was horrible. You know, he was reading. Yeah, the adventure, it was awful. But at the same time, I immediately realized the potential of the game. Mm -hmm. So so I said to him, uh, you know, you are a terrible GM. It was awful. But thank you for making me discover role-playing games. But what happened after that, it, I didn't touch anything D&D related for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I said clear of D&D, I was mostly introduced then with, um, with a German game, in fact, uh, the, the Dark Eye. I knew, as uh, soon as you said German game, I immediately was thinking Dark Eye. I think it's uh, because it's uh, the, only, the only one we know. And uh, it was really... Uh, readily available in France. It was, it was quite easy to find, it was cheap. So I started with that and then it was Call of Cthulhu and many, many BRP games. Stormbringer, Hawkmoon, RunQuest. And then 15 years later with, uh, with some friends who were playing only D&D, uh, I started playing D&D with them. But, well, there are a lot of things who, uh, which happened when I started to publish my own games, but if you let me go that way, we're, we're going to be here tomorrow again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, now, given, given that there's, def, there's definitely no shortage of variety in what, in what you meant, in what you uh, mentioned. Um, one thing I'm, one thing I'm curious about is what, pro, what prompted you to develop, to develop your own stuff? What, what sparked that? Because you've you've been you've been writing you've been as we mentioned before you've been writing since two thousand seven. Yeah, uh, I, I think you know um, what happened to me is I think what happened to many people who now write their own games is you want to play something, you look at what is on the market and you don't find anything that fits your needs. And uh, I, um, my first game, yeah, two two thousand and seven. Uh, I've read uh, some some bit of uh, of Greek history. It was about uh, Greek mercenaries trapped in the Persian Empire, mm -hmm. who were trying to go back home. Uh, and um, and I was looking and I say, oh, that's cool. There must be a, a role playing game about that. There was nothing. So okay, I said I said to myself, well, if I don't find it, I. Uh, I'll have to I'll have to write it myself, and for most of my games, I'd say I'd say all my games, it's always 
come from this is uh, I have to I have to write a game because I don't find a game that suits my need or my group. Now as, now, as I mentioned before, one of the one of the big claims to fame that you've that you've had in writing has been the Black Sword hack, which is yeah. bi which first first off, how did you first, given that that is well a hack of the Black Hack, um, how did you first come across the Black Hack? Uh, I come across the Black Hack when I um, simply when I, I started to take an interest in. Uh, in OSR games, simply. So, you know, it was, I think the first one I found was a uh, Sword and Wizardry, White Box. I translated that one uh, in French. And, you know, just, uh, as you know, you go on forums, uh, read what people say, and someone said, I think, oh, you know, you should take a look at the Black Egg because it does thing, things pretty differently. And, uh, there is a there is an, uh, a neat mechanic called the usage die, and you should look into it. I say, oh, okay, let's do that. And at the same time, I was uh, I was itching to run uh, a game based on uh, the Stormbringer book series, mm -hmm. and simply w one of my players he he, he hates percental dice, so. The official Stormbringer uh, game or Elric, it was, it was not even an option. So I'd say, well, okay, I'll write then a game so so I can play this with my group. In fact, that's uh, that's how the Black Sword Act uh, came to be. In fact, now with that with that in mind, that bring that brings me to um, Fleo, which yeah. Uh, Thank you, thank you for putting in a thing, a thing on how on how to pronounce it, so that so that I don't stumble into it or try and do really bad French. <laughs> um, but you describe Fleo as a medieval slash early Renaissance slash Baroque fantasy. Now, with some of those, a lot of a lot of people will have some degree of an understanding of that, but. Well, I think less people are familiar with the concept of Baroque, and I'd like you to go into what is meant by Baroque fantasy and what that entails. Ah, uh, yes. Baroque, um, it... So, most of the game is based around, uh, uh, around uh, the 17th century. And really, uh, what I meant by Baroque in... Uh, how to say in a in a RPG environment, it was really you know with bigger than life situations, settings where uh, how to say uh, how to say that it's where really the world is bigger than the than the heroes and everything. Most many things are. A bit exaggerated, maybe. I think that's that's how. Uh, and really, it was to to replace, what well, to place the setting in uh, with a strong seventeenth century influence. In fact, that, that was that was the main goal when when I referred to Baroque. Yeah. And with with that in with that in mind, you. Now, with with um, with certain get with certain games, they've talked they've talked quite a bit about their about their about their media influences. Um, I remember in the I remember for Mothership, which is cur which they're currently kickstarting that big version of, they did a, a whole bingo sheet of the different films and, and the like that were influences. What were some of the influences for the creation of Fleo? No, oh, it, it it's mostly I found most oh, the main influence uh, would say on the RPG side would be would be of course would be uh, War Warhammer of course British British game, mm -hmm. but on the other side the main influence uh, was uh, was in fact history history books. Uh, in French I wrote I, I wrote a, a small RPG called Stricha which. Uh, was based on the uh, 17th 
Century Europe. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, and I, as I was writing the game, I said to myself, no, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to learn a bit more about that. So I get back to college and, and got a history degree, you know, uh, mm -hmm. for three years. And uh, I was quite fascinated with uh, 7th century history. And I wanted, you know, to make like a fantasy version of, of it, but not as, uh, maybe not as cartoony as uh, the Warhammer world can be. Mm -hmm. I wanted something uh, uh, a bit more grounded and not with, uh, uh, you know, not with evil, uh, evil races everywhere and the legends of chaos who are um, not something that evident. I wanted, I really wanted to make something a bit more grounded. So my main inspirations mainly are history books, in fact. Because in media, you don't have... You don't have many things about about that period. There, there is a movie with uh, Omar Sharif called uh, The Lost Valley and with uh, Michael Caine, which is a good one, but you uh, Flesh and Blood, of course, too, uh, by, by, by Verhoeven. In, um, in the manga side, uh, you too, you have uh, Kentaro Miura uh, Berserk, Bruger and uh, yes, but mainly mainly history books. In fact, mm -hmm. because in popular media you don't have so much things about uh, uh, about that period. In fact, mm -hmm. of course you have uh, Three Musketeers and things like that, but it's not it's not my favorite um, my favorite approach. I would say. All right. Now that br that brings me to the vi to um the visual style that you have that you have present within the book at, le at least from what i've seen on the on the kickstarter which is ver is um very reminiscent of some of some of the more visually striking um st styles of book that i've seen that i've seen that i've seen in and out of osr obviously obviously the big the big one that a lot of people are going to bring up is is um, Mork Borg but how did you meet up with the uh, with your art director Edgara um, he had uh, at one moment he, he, he had a podcast, you know, and he did an interview. We we were talking about OSR games, mm -hmm. and we you, you know it was uh, it was it was twenty twenty in the right in the in the thick of, of the pandemic, and you know I was seeing that people around me were were getting well, people were were miserable, in fact. And uh, at the time when I first uh, the first version of Fleo, uh, it was it was re really a small uh, a small text. It was I don't know fifteen pages, something like that. And I said to myself, you know, I just make it free so, so people can can download it. And then Edgar said, oh, if you want, you know, I'm a I'm a art director. I, I worked as an art director for twenty years. If you want, I can, I can make the layout for for the game. So I said, yeah, of course, let's do that. So we did. We we uh, we released a, a twenty pages a free version uh, of the game, and it quite stick with people, at least in France, because it was only available uh, available in French at the time. So uh, I said to myself, well, maybe we can do you know something a bit more ambitious. And the guy uh, was really up to the task. He said, "Yeah, yeah, I want to, I want to work on this game because I want to flex those creative muscles." So I said to him, "Okay, I write the text, but for the rest of the game, you have a carte blanche. You can do what you want." And so we we end up with uh, with the with the book as it looks now, which is. Well, it kind of does it. And of course, uh, Edgar knows the guy who did the, the layout for uh, Mark Borg. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yes, evidently it was, it was quite, a, quite a, huge, a huge influence on him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, that, be, that, being that being said, as I, 
the as I under as I understand it, um, Fleo is using is using a fair bit of the DNA of that roll that roll under stuff that a lot of people look at with the black hack. But you're doing your own quirks with it within it, as I as I understand it. Um, I'd like you to go into some into um into some into some of the things that you're that you're doing that's that um that is building around that roll under system. Yeah. Um, so f first of all, you um, one of one of the things in the black hack that was interesting, you know, of course, was well, the usage die, but I, for me, it, it didn't click immediately because I, you know, if it was only to count, you know, your arrows, uh, your torches, things like that, I, I didn't, I didn't find that, that interesting. In fact, I, I, I kind of didn't see the point, you know. You know, to count your arrows, all you have to do is to be able to count to 20. You know, it doesn't seem so overwhelming to me. So it, it, it didn't click at first. But then I, I came across a game named uh, The Mecha Hack mm -hmm. uh, by Absolute Tabletop. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and in that game, they, they created... Uh, they used the usage die in a different way uh, that was called the reactor die. So basically, when your big robot, so for those who don't know, basically make a hack is you play you play big robots who, uh, in the spirit of Gundam or, or BattleTech, that that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reactor die basically it's a kind of resource you have to use to power up your uh, your robot actions. But, of course, if it's exhausted, bad things happen to you. Mm -hmm. And then, at that moment, it clicked for me. I say, okay, this is a cool use of the usage die. Because it kind of give, it gives power, choice, I'd say, to the player to, okay, I want to make cool things, but they may, they may be a price to pay. And it's not only resource management, because as you use a die, it's not okay. I'm gonna use one point, two points, and if I save one point, I'm okay. No, it's a die. It's kind of always you. You're taking a bet. Okay, am I pushing things too far or not? Mm -hmm. So I used I used that in uh, in my first adaptation of the Black Hack. It was a game called Extinction. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a it's based on on, on Alien. It's my own Alien uh, RPG ripoff. What? And uh, I used it as uh, the adrenaline die. So basically, you want to do you want to do some some stuff with your character. You have to roll adrenaline, and if and if your adrenaline is exhausted, you panic. I refined it with uh, with the black sword act, uh, which where it was named the doom die, and then in flail where I refined it again. Uh, it's now called the will power die. So I'd say uh, the main difference with the black hack is the introduction of this die because in fact I discover with every game all the ways you can use it to reflect the different things. So for example in, in Flail you can decide in combat that you want to add a special effect to your attack no problem, but you must roll your willpower die. You want to cast a, a spell, you have to roll the willpower die. But the thing that I wanted to keep, it's always a player's choice. It's not the, the DM who can tell you, ah, no, 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 you're, you're in deep shit because I decided you're in deep shit. Mm -hmm. Characters always, players end up in deep shit because they try to push their luck too far. And it creates a tension at the table that really it worked. I think it works uh, at last, at least it, it, it worked really well at, uh, at my tables. Yeah. Now, you described sorcery in the, in the book as, or in the Kickstarter page, as dangerous and messy. And I'd, I'd like to go into a bit of more detail on how, on how sorcery is going to work to 
rein to reinforce the playing with fire net attitude that a setting like this is going to be is going to be leaning towards. Yeah. So my my main goal with uh, with, with sorcery, I, I I took most most of the spells you you can find in you can find them on the Black Sword Act too. I, I did a, a bit more. But my main idea, you know, when I was looking at what was existing in terms of rules about sorcery, I always found the same kind of logic. You know, sorcery is dangerous, so it corrupts the, the user. So basically, the more and more you use sorcery, the more you are corrupted. You know, kind of like um, always... For me, I didn't like that because it, it was kind of taking agency from the player. It was like if the, uh, the rules were saying to you, sorcery is bad and you don't must use it too much because, because you'll be corrupted. I didn't find that very interesting. And in fact, what, what I tried to do is not to create a sorcery that corrupts the character. I wanted to create a system where the sorcery corrupts the player. So how did I do that? Uh, let's just take an example. You, you can cast a spell uh, which forces a person to tell you the truth, to answer, to answer your questions. But it will only answer D4 questions. But only the GM throws the D4 and knows how many questions you can ask. Mm -hmm. If you ask more questions than the result of the D4, that person dies immediately. Mm -hmm. Whereas another spell, it can, uh, it can deafen all the enemies in sight, but also kills any children or animals that are in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. So always... Always, you always know that when you use a spell, somebody's gonna pay. And it's not, and it's not uh, always the sorcerer. And I found that interesting because some, what, what I've seen uh, in game, some players, they tend to be very squeamish with it and they, and they really, they throw, they, they cast a spell only when in a dire situation, but other players, they go full Tulsa Doom, you know? Ah, okay, I don't care what happens around me, I don't care about other people, I will cast my spells and hell will follow. So it, it, it creates quite a nice dynamic at the table, but uh, yeah, if you use sorcery in Fleo or in Black Sword Act, most of the time you end up being a bad guy and you don't have to resort to corruption points or whatever things like that it's really deep down comes to a player's choice as well now one of the things that you decided to highlight in bold is the is the factor that you that characters are classless and they're de defined by origin upbringing occupation and crime now I know, I know, so, I know. Some are sh are shocked and are on their fainting couch about not having to deal with classes in a fantasy game, um, but we're but we don't operate that way here in the te here in the temple. <laughs> um, the couch is for the couch is for sleeping o sleeping off hangovers, not for fainting on. Yeah. But I'd like you to go into the those steps: origin, upbringing, occupation, and crime, and. How they play a factor in character creation? Yes, yes, of course. So, yeah, first of all, like I said before, you know, I was, I was not raised on D and D tropes. In fact, so classes uh, for a long time seemed a bit unnatural for me. After that, I, I, I see the advantages of classes. You know, mm -hmm. when you say to a player, you're okay, you're a warrior, you're a magician, you're a thief, you kind of know what your place is in the fiction. It's very efficient with that. And, uh, and there's plenty of ways to reintroduce that. You know, clans in Vampire, I'm sorry, but they are just classes. By any other name. And, uh, but I wanted... I wanted something, you know, 
that gives players okay a, a starting point for their character, so they know who their character is. But I don't want that to define what their character their character will become, which in my mind most of the time classes do. If you are a warrior, you will never know. You will never learn magic. Of course, now there quite some difference on that subject, but. I didn't want people to feel confined mm. in their class. So the, the steps, so for example, the origins of uh, the character. So basically you have, um, you have different uh, people, uh, folk in, uh, in Flail. So of course you have, you get human, you get dwarf, you got elf, you got halfling, mm -hmm. but you have also ogre blooded, blooded and, uh, and goblin, because of course goblin are fun. And simply, when you create your character, you pick one of these origins, and uh, for each for each origin, you have uh, six possible outcomes. So let's say I don't know you want to you want to play a, a dwarf. So you throw a d6, and it gives you a little bit of background about your character and an attribute bonus. So, for example, dwarf. If I roll a two, I, uh, my dwarf received his education in the stinking mushroom fields of my city, mm -hmm. and I get the point to strength. If I roll a six, I receive my education at the bottom of a mine with a pickaxe in hand. And the table are different, are different for each origin. So the point was, it gives you a small bonus mechanical to your attribute, but it also gives you. Um, a little flavor for your origin story. Mm -hmm. And, and okay, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, go, go ahead. And, yeah, yeah, and just to finish, and then of course you have uh, you have to justify why why the characters are on the road mm -hmm. seeking adventure, and you, all characters have been accused of committing a crime. It's up to the player to decide if. He was wrongly accused, or if he did commit that crime, there's no there's no rule for that in the book. It's uh, it's player choice. Uh, but uh, then yes, you uh, it's a uh, it's uh, you you throw a twenty sided die, and uh, you know you can be on the road because you robbed a, a tax collector, because you took a bribe, because you made a pact with a demon, etc. etc. And I think that some people it will help them uh, quick start the campaign or at least their character story. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, now, one thing one thing that I think I think some people might um, might ha might have might have a bit of an adjustment period is how you're handling how you handle initiative. Because I think a lot of people th see it as you you roll and then you com and then you compare that init then you look at everybody's initiative in order and there's your turn order. Whereas you're doing a success fail approach. Uh, I'd like you go. I'd like you to go into th into um that. Basic basically, I um. So first of all, I wanted to keep um the. The, uh, the same mechanic all around, and the backbone of, of the system, of course, is the attribute role. I didn't want to make an initiate an initiative role who doesn't really work like an attribute role. It it seemed I don't know superfluous to me. Uh, secondly, I uh, one thing I'd like in old uh, say in old D and D, you know, it's uh, the initiative. You roll a d6. If you uh, uh, and basically if you do more, if you do more than the gem, then the whole group of characters act before the monsters. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to have the um, the best of both worlds. It's uh, you. St it's still on on an individual basis, so your character can fail this check. Mm -hmm. But uh, characters that all, uh, for example, made their check. They can then see between them how to how to maybe uh, uh, have a tactical approach to the confrontation. 
And another thing that I wanted to have, it was inspired by an old, uh, an old game, uh, which, which had a new edition recently, is Twilight 2000. Mm -hmm. And there was an, uh, a nice idea in, uh, in that game is if you want to act first in a combat situation, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you are, if you have a high dexterity or high perception is the only, it, it was called, I think, coolness under fire. And that, that's why in Flare you use a guts role, because the main thing is, are you going to lose it when something, when someone attacks you? Mm -hmm. In fact, that, that's that's the idea I wanted to have uh, also for the initiative system. You know, I did not want uh, ballad dancers to go to 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 go before battle hardened warriors. In fact, mm -hmm. that was the, that was the the idea behind it. So, and I think I saw it used also in um, that kind of initiative in Electric Bastion Land. Uh, I think it's the same system too. Yeah. Now, with with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, given given the given the inspirations and the fact that you're going with a very a very a very um, brutal setup, um, visual visuals notwithstanding. What are some of the ways mechanically that you re that you reinforce that brutality and that um, sense of lethality? So, um, main thing is uh, the hit point progression is very very limited. Uh, you start uh, so you start your career uh, with hit points equal to your strength score. So it's basically it's between eight and fourteen. Uh, then, uh, as you progress, there are 10 levels of experience, but you only gain 1 point, 1 HP per level. Mm -hmm. So, at, at most, at best, you end up with a character that has 25, 28 points, at, mm -hmm. at the most. So, combat will always be, uh, will always be dangerous. Always. You, no matter how, how good you are, uh, a monster, a good monster with two to three hits can put you down. Mm -hmm. So the so the idea really was to uh, for players to to always let's just say uh, have the mentality. Uh, you know, it's all it's been said a lot not to to see combat as a sport but as a war. Oh, you you know you try to surprise the enemy. You try to use guerrilla tactics, mm -hmm. but you don't go there. Ah, oh, it's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that uh, that goblin. Uh, that, no, because things can go can go can go P shaped pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And the second mechanic is, uh, as I said before, it's the willpower die because. Uh, from what I've seen, at least in, in my playtest, it always creates some kind of tension because players are, are always pushing the luck, always, because there is almost no other way to, to go forward. So there is always a tension, no matter, and still no matter how powerful your, your character can get. Mm -hmm. So I'd say these are the two... On the mechanical side, these are the two main points. On the setting signs, they are oversight, and I can elaborate if, if you wish. Yes, please. Yeah. So, uh, as I said before, the setting, I, I wanted it to be pretty grounded. So, um, it's not like there is, you know, a big army of chaos waiting, uh, waiting behind the mountains. Most of the conflicts uh, that happen in the setting of Leo is basically it's politics. Mm -hmm. It's politics. It's uh, domination. Uh, it's conquest. That kind of thing. Uh, when the campaign starts, uh, there's no open war, but there are a lot of political intrigues, and uh, let's just say that everything. Mostly everything is in shades of grey. You never know who you will side with, and there are no 
real bad guys. There, there is one bad guy in the in the setting, one empire, because uh, it's an empire that uh, that chooses slavery. So of course that makes him, by definition, that makes him the bad guy. But it it really it's, it's the exception. And as always, the empire, this empire, is bad, but its inhabitants, not all of them are monsters. So you can go, you you, you can just go in there and uh, and throw an axe uh, uh, at everybody's head. That, that's not going to cut it. So yes, I try to have. Yes, a shades of grey approach, mm -hmm. not a big bad monster uh, you can kill uh, every week. Mm -hmm. And I'm ge I'm guessing that I'm guessing that within the within that since you since you're not having the, you're not having that kind of b bag, um, that that there seems to be the implication that er that early on the you're not going to have a whole you're not going to have a much in the, much in the way of supernatural foreknowledge from a player perspective. No, no. In fact, no, no, no. You may have uh, you 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 may you know have uh, learn uh, one or, or two spells maybe, but uh, for the rest, no, no. You don't have much foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, with the, with that in mind. One thing that one thing that I am that I am I am curious about since you are going classless is how you're going to have advancement work. Is it going to be a um, a spending XP kind of kind of approach, or do you have something else in mind? Uh, I I went I went for um, it, it, it's quite basic. Basically, you gain between one and three experience points each session you play. Uh, and every five X point, uh, XP, you, you gain a level, a level basically. And at each level, you have, uh, you have specific benefits. So for example, uh, when you get to level two, you get a plus one to one of your attributes and plus one HP. At, and at odd levels, you gain what I call, uh, a talent, a trait. And these are more like, uh, I would say, um, almost psychological tra traits. You can become a fetishist, a duelist, you can become paranoid. Paranoid, for example, is just that it gives you uh, a bonus to your initiative, for example. Uh, you can become dangerous, which means you, you uh, even when you're attacked, you always damage your opponent. And that kind of thing. But it's uh, what I wanted to have is for players to be able to kind of build their characters as they wish as the campaign goes. So, for example, you are, uh, even if you started as a dwarf uh, barbarian, maybe uh, at one time you, you'll become a diplomat or maybe you'll learn uh, a bit of magic. That kind of thing. I want it to be pretty open. It's not over, over, overly powerful. At uh, if I'm not saying, uh, I would say uh, yes. Uh, at most, your character will have three talents, three traits. At uh, once he arrives at ten levels, so it's not uh, you know you you won't have a catalog of new powers with your character, but it will help. You know, kind of, kind of see what your character become as uh, his adventures goes on. You know? yeah. And when it comes to ta when it comes to talents, do you have them in one big list, or do you have them somewhat ca somewhat categorized based on theme? No, I have a, I have one big list, mm -hmm. but I'd say I, w I don't want to say I want to. Uh, I think it's tw uh, um, 20, 20 plus 20 plus talents it's a, it's a, it's a restrained uh, it's a restrained list as i say you only have three so it, it gives you it gives you a nice uh, a nice selection i would say oh, all right and as i understand it you're shooting for around around 100 pages yeah yeah, yeah, that's uh, 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 as was said in the Kickstarter page. The um, the book is already laid out, 
So for now we are looking at yes 101 page and to that we'll add uh, just some uh, a, a small gaming aid it's all the spells on small cards that you can print and give to your players if you need. Mm. So that will add maybe four or five pages more for the PDF. Yeah. And and um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the for the project? I know you've got I know you've got twenty two days to to go at the time of this recording, and congratulations on getting pretty close to four thousand euros at the time. Thank you, thank you. It, it, it's thanks to you and, and, and all the backers. No, uh, as I say, I, uh, as I wrote in the in the Kickstarter, this is my first Kickstarter, so I really don't want to mess it up. So that's why, uh, as I said, the text, everything is written and everything is laid out. So uh, to yesterday, I sent the last batches of corrections to to Edgar. So so uh, people will get the PDF of the game as soon as the campaign is over. So uh, first, uh, first of March, uh, you will get a coupon uh, to get uh, to get the PDF of the game. After that, I'll uh, I'll set aside one week for people uh, for get uh, for getting feedback from people because as much as you. Uh, as you hunt for for typos, you always find new ones. Yeah, so, always, always. That's uh, so. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, I hope community feedback uh, will work there. Then th second week of March, Edgar will integrate all these corrections. Then I order my proof copy. So the goal is to is for people to be able to order the book at the end of March. Mm -hmm. So basically PDF at the end of the, of the campaign, that's, uh, that, that's a given. And uh, if uh, the proof copy, uh, if I have no problem with the proof copy, at the end of March, uh, people will be, at, uh, will be able to order a copy of the book. And I will cer I will certainly be looking forward to seeing ha to seeing how it go how it goes about. And I always I always love seeing t seeing potential stale tales of knaves getting completely over their head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think you like the first uh, the there is an uh, introdu uh, introductory inventor in the book, which is pretty brutal, but. Uh... Pretty efficient. As all characters have been accused of a crime, of course you start your adventure in a prison. So, yes, things will go mega badly from there. Well, let's let's be let's be honest. We know we all know we all know the old the old saying about the best laid plans. Things will go badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You pro you probably played Shadowrun at least once. You know how this go. You know how this works. Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> oh. oh, Shadowrun! Yes, four hour. Yes, four hour of people making a plan, and then one hour of people screaming and screaming and uh, and uh, and dying. That's mm -hmm. pretty much all all my Shadowrun sessions as I remember them. Well, the the other the other half was six hours of planning, and then everybody just bust through the front door shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, because yes, one player is kind of is kind of fed up with the planning, and oh, screw you! I'm going with my gun. Bye. Mm -hmm. That happened quite a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Best best way to play Shadowrun is you get the the Super Nintendo game. It's it's easier. I'd go with either, either that or the um or that trilogy of games that Harebrained put out, which yeah yeah, mm. quite good yeah quite good games yeah. Plus. Well, if I if I were to go through the mod when it when it comes to that game, then much like with the mods of Factorio, I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll just end up digging so deep into that rabbit hole I hit magma. <laughs> but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come up to my show and enjoy the madness around here. Uh, thank you for inviting me and for indulging in my uh, in my uh, Maurice Chevalier French accent. I, I I know it can it can be grating. So 
Thank you for your patience. No, not not grading it, not grading at all, and like, and you're far you're far from the first, you're far from the first Frenchman to be to be in the temple. So. <laughs> cool, cool. But thank you very much for the invite. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often yeah. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Fine by me. My mother is Russian, so I've got a strong education on that on that on that subject. Mm -hmm. I would say. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present. My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty!